Welcome to the Sense of Sounds first roundtable entitled Political and Social Soundscapes. My name is Evan Spritzer, a recent PhD from the IFS and NYU's Department of History, now teaching at the Cooper Union and at Hunter College. And I am delighted to moderate this discussion between four eminent scholars who have all integrated sound into their explorations of music, literature, and history. In this roundtable, each panelist will make a 15-minute presentation. At the conclusion of all the presentations, we have given them the opportunity to ask each other questions or to comment on each other's papers. We will then open the discussion to the audience for questions and comments, and we ask that questions be succinct <laughs> to give everyone a chance um, to respond. We begin with Timmy Witz, who is a professor of French at New York University. She is also affiliated with the NYU Departments of Medieval and Renaissance Studies, Religious Studies, and Comparative Literature. Timmy has written extensively on performance in the medieval and early modern periods. She co-edited Performing Medieval Narrative for Cambridge and D.S. Brewer, published in 2005, and Medieval and Early Modern Performance in the Eastern Mediterranean for Turnout and Brepols in 2014. Her most recent monograph, Invitation à la performance de récits français médiévaux, Virtuosité, Spectacle, Erotisme, has been accepted for a publication by Paradigm. Much of Timmy's current work focuses on emotions, but she has also published on medieval liturgy, the Bible in the Middle Ages, hagiography, and religious thought. You've been very busy. I've the title of long. her, <laughs> the title of her presentation today is "Sounds in the Street, Vendors' Cries, and the Ringing of Church Bells." So I have some sound files, but I'll reserve them for later, and if we have time, I won't, don't have time to bring them up during my little presentation. So in my talk, I want to focus on two important kinds of sounds heard in the streets almost everywhere in Europe in the middle medieval period and well beyond. First, the cries of people selling their wares, and second, the ringing of church bells. These two kinds of sounds were historically a major part of the urban soundscape, and in an important sense, they were both omnipresent and insistent, and they were in competition with each other. Let me begin by laying out some basic facts, and then I'll focus briefly on four points of contrast between the two kinds of street sounds that I happen to find of particular interest. The relation of these sounds to other parts of the sensorium, the recognizability and, and memorability of these voices, the transparency of message versus the presence of a code, and finally, the particular character of the message in relation to a vertical and horizontal axis. So, <clears throat> starting already in the Middle Ages, hawkers of all kinds populated and animated the streets of cities and towns. They loudly proclaimed their wares. They appeared to typically to have moved around a neighborhood calling out what they were selling, cockles and mussels, fresh meat pies, hot cross buns, miraculous remedies for anything that ailed you. They offered services of various kinds, such as knife and sword sharpening, chair mending, and chimney sweeping, you name it. A great many works of literature and popular culture make reference to these cries. As early as the 13th century, we have detailed references to the street cries of Paris. J'ai bon fromage de champagne, fromage de brie, au lait commerce, sa voisine, and so on. Flowers, straw, old shoes, mushrooms, soap, just about everything. In the 16th century, Rabelais talks about them as well, and it's clear that the streets of Paris were very noisy, even in his day. They may have gotten noisier since. It's hard for us to judge today. Anyway, it's been noisy. They were noisy starting early. These street cries, these sonic encounters, were not just noises among the many other loud noises in the street from vehicles, animals, and others. They were more or less melodic. They were simple songs. Some of the melodies survive in folk songs, children's songs, and rhymes, and I have a couple of sound files if we get interested. But along with the loud and insistent cries of street vendors, also going back hundreds of years, 
Another part, major part of the loud European soundscape has been the ringing of church bells. From tall towers, church bells rang often and loudly down into the street. Some bell ringing called to prayer at certain times of the day, such as the Angelus, to which I've got a sound file for that, to which Francois Villon refers in the 15th century. The most alarming of the bells heard in the street was the tocsin, one that warned students of danger and historically of attack. Though this bell might also ring for other major news, the 13-ton bell named Emmanuel in Notre Dame de Paris rang on August 24, 1944 to announce that the liberation of Paris had begun. There was the cheerful pealing typically of multiple bells for major feasts such as Christmas and Easter and for <laughs> happy occasions such as weddings, coronation, and the birth of future rulers. Sometimes for great occasions, in particular in England, the bells were rung in complex rotational patterns called change ringing. Bells also told they rang a knell or gla when a member of the parish was dying or had died. In some places, these bells were muffled with, a, with pieces of leather to give them a mournful and less bright sound. In some places, that this passing bell, as it was called, told the status and sometimes the age of the person who had died, the number of years of his or her life. This was therefore informative to other members of the community. The passing bell over the centuries provided memorable sounds and a highly powerful concept. Ask not for whom the bell tolls, it tolls for thee, as John Donne said, echoed hundreds of years later by Hemingway in the title of his novel, For Whom the Bell Tolls. So such are some basic facts. Let me now turn briefly to the four issues that I find particularly interesting. So the first is the relation of the sound to other parts of the sensorium. Street cries were produced by people walking in the street and therefore, in fact, in theory, visible. And there are images of street vendors, collections of pictures of these often colorful characters exist, such as those produced by Abraham Voss in the 17th century. But what is also striking is that in many cases, the cries were just heard and the vendors were not in fact seen. They might be heard from a distance or be lost in a crowd, visually speaking. Thus, they represented an auditory experience far more reliably than a visual one. People speak, in particular in the 19th century, of din, uh, more than, more than the, of the visuality of this. In some cases, as with regard to food, the smell of the wares might be powerful. Meat pies, cheese from champagne, fresh strawberries. And buyers might be lured to sample and buy the wares based, the wares based on the lovely smell. But again, the street cries afforded primarily an auditory experience. Bells, too, were, of course, primarily auditory. But they also brought in another experience as well. The bells were, in general, quite invisible. They hung high in towers, surrounded by heavy masonry. They were hung by, rung by long ropes, pulled with considerable effort by bell ringers, who also remained invisible. It might indeed take over a dozen men to ring a single large bell. Only a small number of people would ever actually have seen the bells clearly, if at all. The bells were thus sound. But they were also more clearly and powerfully than most other sounds, vibration. A 16-ton bell, when it rings, provides a strong shaking experience to those nearby, something that would be felt bodily in a very powerful way. I'm reminded of a, of a novel by Dorothy Sayers, one of the great mystery writers of, the 20th, of, the, of, the, of our century, who wrote in The Nine Tailors of a character who dies and one who almost dies from being up in a belfry when change, a long change ringing uh, event is taking place. So it, these, were, these were dangerous vibrations if you were anywhere near. Second, the recognizability and memorability of the voices. Street vendors naturally had distinctive and recognizable voices, whether perceived as attractive or unattractive, beautiful or ugly. And vendors who frequented a particular neighborhood over time had a voice that was remembered by those who had heard it, and if they liked the wares, might return and get more. The vendors rarely, however, were known by name. There exist a few songs that evoke particular singers, vendors by name, such as the famous ballad Cockles and Muscles that sings of one Molly Malone, but she seems to have been made up. She doesn't seem to be a historical figure. These recognizable human voices were, of course, ephemeral. Individual vendors all passed away eventually, and Molly Malone in the song Cockles and Muscles is even in the song represented as already dead. 
Like human singers, bells also had distinctive voices. A particular bell's ring, its tone was recognizable. Bells came with different pitches and sounds. Each sang or rang or played a different note, a single note with a particular quality. The sound of the bell or bells of a particular church was thus intimately familiar to the people of the parish. It was often for them the sound of home. Great bells had names and still do, as in the case of the large Emmanuel bell that I mentioned earlier. It dates from 1681. Among the bells of Notre Dame in the 13th and 14th centuries were Guillaume, Chambellan, Louis, and Marie. There were others. At the present time, Notre Dame has 10 bells, all of them named. Each of which plays a different note. Emmanuel plays F sharp and so forth. There are thus famous named bells whose voices were and remain recognizable long after anonymous street vendors have passed into oblivion. The voices of great bells clearly lasted for generations, even centuries, though they were fragile and prone to breakage. Bells are beloved. The silencing of major bells can be very controversial. For example, recently in 2012-13, the bells of Notre Dame de Paris were removed and replaced on the grounds that they had lost their pure tones. There was a great brouhaha <laughs> over this change perceived as an attack on the tradition of the cathedral. Third, the transparency of message versus the presence of a code. The meaning of street cries was in general self-evident. What hawkers were selling, they made obvious. It was not useful for vendors to be in any way coy or mysterious about what they were peddling. This was not the way to make a living. The message of church bells was, of course, nonverbal, but it was an act of communication. In fact, they were often called signa. Sometimes the message of a bell was obvious just from the sound itself. A loud warning by the insistent ringing of a very large bell is hard to misconstrue. But in many cases, the particular character of the message was somewhat mysterious. It might be fully apparent only to those who knew the code, and the code might be local to a particular parish or a particular religious order. A good example would be the passing bell that I referred to above earlier. As noted, this bell was often muffled in the ringing of it, so only those who knew the code would understand that sound and realize its importance. The number of rings would in a particular place indicate whether the person who had died was clergy or lay, male or female, and how many years the person had lived. Thus, bell ringing often had a coded in that sense of mysterious quality built in to its communicative act. Bell rings often had to be interpreted by a listener who had to listen carefully. And finally, I'd like to speak very briefly on the nature of the message with regard to a kind of an axis. Street cries and the ringing of bells summoned listeners in markedly different ways. We can distinguish between a horizontal and a vertical axis. Street hawkers represent the horizontal. They called out loudly and forcefully to the people nearby, to the nearby pedestrians, if you will, reminding them of all the good things they need in this life now. You need milk and fresh bread and fresh bread and cockles and good cheese and meat pastries. You need to have your swords sharpened and your chairs repaired and so on. You need all these things in order to live and thrive today. By contrast, church bells represented the vertical dimension. They broke in from above. They insistently pulled people out of the here and now. They might warn of impending danger, an enemy attack, or the plague. They said, stop doing what you're doing and attend to this crisis or this news. Bells often, of course, transmitted a supernatural message and called to prayers. Bells seemed like a call, welcome or unwelcome, from heaven. The passing bell told you that someone you might know had just died. It might tell you who it was by the number of rings. Again, stop what you're doing, pray, and perhaps ponder your own mortality. Now, I've been painting with a very broad brush, speaking mostly about the European past, although some of this was certainly, has certainly been present in the United States as well. Many of the sounds of which I've been speaking are heard a great deal less today than they were in the past, for reasons beyond my purview here. But both streets' cries and the ringing of church bells con contributed significantly in different and often competing ways to the creation of a powerful auditory community. Both sets of sounds certainly have left their mark on Western literature and culture. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our second panelist, Annegret Foser, is the Carrie C. Bachamar 
distinguished professor of music, and the Harold J. Glass United States Air Force graduate mentor distinguished term professor for the period 2017 to 2020, and an adjunct professor of women's, women's and gender studies at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her research focuses on music of the 19th and 20th centuries, particularly that of France and the United States. Her two most recent books are Sounds of War, Music in the United States During World War II, published in 2013, Oxford University Press, and The Politics of Music Identity, published in 2015 in the Ashgate Contemporary Thinkers on Critical <coughs> Musicology series. Her book on Aaron Copland's Appalachian Spring will be out this month, also with Oxford. She is currently writing a monograph entitled In the Shadow of Beethoven, Musical Universalism and Transnational Scholarship in the 1920s. Her presentation today is entitled Some Reflections from the Interwar Years. <coughs> Sorry, here we have sounds, do we? Um, it actually, in all the communication, the front of the title somehow got lost. <clears throat> ah. It was meant to be sound, music sound silence, some reflections from the interwar years. Indeed. On November 11, 1918, at 11 a.m. on the Western Front, the weapons fell silent. The ceasefire, so witnesses reported later, created an extraordinary experience of silence when all arms stopped almost at once ending the relentless, mechanized noise of war with its guns, bombs, and airplanes. That war could be an acoustic hell had long been reflected in letters and poems, reports, and music. Written shortly before Theodor Körner perished in the Battle of Leipzig in 1813, the dashing soldier poet's famous verse, Gebet während der Schlacht, Prayer during battle, evoked the Schlachten Donnerwetter the thunderstorm of battle, with its roaring and booming of death. Its imagery became part of the vocabulary through which European soldiers and civilians referred to the overpowering din of battle. Yet the soundscape of World War I was different. Years of incessant noise along the trenches, with a physical pain generated by its sheer loudness to the point that, quote, your head wants to explode, unquote, created a violent and inescapable soundscape never before heard. When it was over, on that November morning, the silence that descended over the battlefields seemed alien and downright eerie. As Richard Foote, a British artilleryman stationed in Maubeuge, wrote about his experience, quote, it was, a strange, it was quite strange to ride back to the battery in the quiet that followed 11 o'clock. One had got used to the background noise of shell fire, which could often be heard as far away as the south coast of England. Near the front, it seemed a continuous orchestration of deep and echoing sound, punctuated by the sharp rat-tat-tat of rifle or machine gun fire. Peace seemed a very strange and new experience." Unquote. Other soldiers, too, marveled at the acoustic shift from war to peace. Indeed, the mindful perception of silence would become the marker both of the end of World War I and its commemoration when for the first anniversary of Armistice Day, King George V instigated the ritual of observing a two-minute silence at 1 a.m., a ritual that spread quickly across the Western world. Bounded by the viscerally experienced extremes of noise and silence at the end of global combat, that dramatic sonic shift became one of the markers of understanding sound and music after the cataclysm of World War I. The tr transition from war to peace was difficult. It is hard to grasp the daily struggle for physical survival, 
between 1918 and 1920, in most of continental Europe and even Great Britain, when hunger, rubble and infections, not least the terrible flu pandemic that killed more people than the enemy fire, dominated daily life. Music's roles were manifold at this point in time, helping to mourn the dead and a lost way of life, continuing to boost morale, affirming national identities across the Western Hemisphere, and increasingly commemorating the war as its presence began to recede in everyday life. Yet, as Danish Ertan and William Brooks have pointed out recently, these events brought on not only the expected musical performance of commemoration in the aftermath of war, but also marked silence that could not express the inexpressible in the face of what was constructed as the inaudible and unheroic devastation of influenza. There were no models to commemorate an epidemic musically. This expansive sense of deathly silence differed from and yet merged with the sonic configuration of the end of this global war as a shift from noise to silence. In the 1920s, silence thus became both a marker of peace and a signifier of post-war civilian suffering. Nine years after the war ended, one particular musical milestone allowed for a transnational confrontation with this sense of silence as a marker of torment, the centenary of Ludwig van Beethoven's death in 1927. The reach of this commemoration encompassed much of the world, from Moscow to Tokyo and from Buenos Aires to Sydney. Moreover, this recognition of the composer and his music was intertwined with pervasive post-war discourses about nationalism and internationalism. Numerous speeches and articles evoked the League of Nations while they claimed Beethoven simultaneously, simultaneously for national validation and international exchange. Local responses, for their part, fashioned Beethoven for their unique cultural contexts. In the Soviet Union, the centenary coincided with the 10th anniversary of the October Revolution, and Beethoven, the revolutionary educator of humanity, was easily recast as a proto-Soviet hero. In the recently established Republic of China, Beethoven was similarly lauded as the heroic defender of democratic revolution, and the Shanghai Municipal Orchestra put on several concerts of his works in the spring of 1927. In Germany, Beethoven's national credentials were fettered across the nation. In Belgium, it was his Flemish origins. In France, the celebration was conducted in the vein of Third Republic routine, including the solemn dedication of a monument in the Parc de Vincennes. Beethoven, as Esteban Buch has shown conclusively, was infinitely malleable in the transnational field of interwar Western music and its politics, given how each nation could reinterpret the composer's significance according to their particular circumstance. Yet despite the different political appropriation of the composer's memory from China to Argentina, the surviving documents from these commemorations point to a common theme across borders. The sustained emphasis on Beethoven's suffering because of his hearing loss and on his death. As the French Minister of Public Education and Fine Arts, Edouard Echieux, voiced during the state ceremony of Beethoven's grave in Vienna in March 27, 1927, quote, Today, as then, aware of our duties to humanity, we cherish in this creature of genius, the poet, who made music a means of persuasion and action more effective than the word. The man who, despite all, crucified by life, retained only tenderness and pity in his work. And I missed a power slide. So here is Eriu giving his speech. The physical handicap writers discussed was, of course, the composer's loss of hearing. And the Heiligenstadt Testament counted among the most reproduced Beethoven documents in the 1927 press, both in various translations and in facsimile. 
implicitly as well as explicitly, Beethoven's suffering and death were connected to that of the recent world war, the silencing of his musical world was cast as the ultimate artistic and human sacrifice. As our roundtable is dedicated to political and social soundscapes, I want to move from the intersection of disability and war trauma during the Beethoven centenary to the politics of his musical performance. Several of the 1927 events across the globe would offer fascinating windows on the post-war construction of Beethoven as a universal genius and messenger of peace, whose music transcended borders for the greater good of humanity. This trope, so dear to Beethoven lovers then and now, not only embodied Eurocentric constructions of culture par excellence, but also created tensions within nations between those who embraced the rhetoric of musical universality and those who resisted the totalizing character of the centenary. In Paris, for instance, music lovers ensured Beethoven's sonic presence even as the state took its time to join the festivities. Yet, as Georges Piauc wrote in his column in Le Soir, one group of Frenchmen to miss out because of the Beethoven centenary celebrations were living composers, even though their absence might be for the better of humanity. <laughs> That's his last sentence. What garnered particular attention in the French press was the first performance by special authorization and under the effective presidency of the Archbishop of Paris of Beethoven's Misa Solemnis in, sorry, <clears throat> in a French church when it was given in Notre Dame on March 17. This performance was France's unique musical contribution to the centenary celebration because it was, as the critic Louis Schneider pointed out, the first time in history that Beethoven's Mass was given in a church. Quote, Yesterday was the first time that the Missa Solemnis, that giant summit dominating over all of Beethoven's masterworks, was given in a church, and what a church it was. Unquote. With much of the diplomatic corps and French officials present, the Archbishop presided over the event. In his speech after the Gloria, Father Pierre Lande, and it would be interesting, I'm not going into that, but he was the first French radio priest. So Father Pierre Lande offered a view of Beethoven, both humanist and Catholic, truly French and universally significant. The Missa Solemnis, he explained, quote, first and foremost, here we go, sorry, first and foremost paid homage to beauty, a grand thing recognized by the French. It honors the country that knew to discern in it one of the jewels of the world's shared heritage. But it also evokes the great life, the great soul of Beethoven, the pain and the tragedy of a broken life whose genius was only understood when it is extinguished and whose heart only when it was frozen. On that day when the musician felt himself sealed like a corpse in the tomb of silence, the great interior Beethoven was born inside of him, and all the harmonies assembled in his heart began to sing in it. Until that moment, all he wrote was music. Now, in his relentless and gigantic works, he created life." Unquote. The 1927 Beethoven centenary consolidated indeed the composer's reputation as the stoic hero whose traumatic disability became the crucible wherein the greatest and universally most impactful music was forged. Today, we call such narratives inspiration porn. <laughs> Back then, 
they validated the music of a white male composer as a classical bulwark protecting what was styled as the universal beauty of Western music, whether in France or in other Eurocentric cultures. When I had outlined my roundtable contribution originally, I had planned to contrast Parisian responses to Beethoven with that to music performed four years later during the 1931 Exposition Coloniale. In a sense, however, this was low-hanging fruit, quotations about European perceptions of African or Asian music as picturesque, locally colored, or racially marked are easy to conjure, a dime a dozen. Not only did musicians from French colonies perform in the framework of this event, but also African-American jazz performers in their so-called jazz hood found their way into a mixture of musics that Parisians understood as primitive expressions of cultural inferiority. Deconstructing the unique constellation of music, sound, and silence in more detail, where the Beethoven centenary was concerned, reveals the violence of a political and social environment where the narrative of heroic creation covers not only the echoes of battle noise, but also the silence that lingered on after so much now inconvenient death. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anna Gret. Um, our third um, paper comes from Rebecca Scales, who is an assistant professor of history at Rochester Institute of Technology. Her book, Radio and the Politics of Sound in Interwar France, published by Cambridge University Press, came out in 2016. She is part of a multi-year Leverhulme International Network project entitled Connecting the Wireless World, Inventing Global Radio. Her new book project retells the history of 20th century France through the lens of polio and its survivors. Her presentation today is entitled Sound in the City of Light, Radio Broadcasting and the Contested Soundscape of interwar Paris. Noise is the most striking characteristic of our modern world, a journalist announced in a Parisian newspaper in 1933. And while complaints about the noise of the capital were by no means new to the interwar decades, from the mid-1920s onward, radios, gramophones, loudspeakers, and public address systems overtook city streets, public venues, and the intimate spaces of homes ensuring that intermittent moments of repose competed with the near constant presence of broadcast sound. Familiar New Yorkers? As the composer and music critic Emile Vuillermoz asserted a few years later, just as there are states of collective soul in the domains of literature, painting, theater, or leisure, there's equally a state of the ear characteristic in certain periods in the history of people. From morning to evening, he lamented, adolescents of today are capable of gorging themselves tirelessly in uninterrupted listening to radio, sound films, and the phonograph, rendering them victims of that collective deformation of our time, that special organic perversion known as the love of noise. So today I want to briefly consider the fascination and anxiety surrounding what Viermoz hailed as a distinctive state of the ear, the new auditory culture created by the democratization of radio and a host of other contemporary electroacoustical technologies, the listening practices they generated, and their subsequent transformations to the soundscape of everyday life. And in doing so, I'd like to make three arguments. First, I think historians have tended to think about radio as a mass media whose significance resided in a sort of public medium penetrating the private sphere. But I want to suggest today that radio might better be understood as a media that produced a sustained and prolonged crisis in definitions of public and private a phenomenon that owed as much to radio waves defiance of boundaries of space, time, and distance as it did to the amplified sounds of radio loudspeakers resonating across the city. Second, while radio boosters and programmers fantasized about creating a mass audience, radio instead cultivated multiple and overlapping radio publics as listeners chose where and with whom to tune into the radio, but at other moments became unwitting publics for sounds they could not control. 
Finally, it was precisely these difficulties in identifying what constituted public and private sounds um, and determining the scope of radio publics that provoked conflicts between municipal authorities, businessmen, and ordinary listeners over how, when, and where it was acceptable for people to listen to broadcast sound. This new everyday politics of listening, which pitted those who sought to quiet the Parisian soundscape over others defending the right to listen, became a defining feature of interwar life. So radio's development as a media in France was intimately linked to the physical landscape of Paris, which was served as a stage for both the transmission and reception of France's first radio broadcasts. In 1921, the Eiffel Tower's radio transmitter, which was constructed by the army in World War I, became the first state-run public radio station, joining the privately owned Radio La in broadcasting record concerts, weather reports, and news bulletins for a few hours a day. By 1931, France counted 25 commercial and state-run stations, six of which were located in the capital. And to attract audiences and sell radios, radio boosters, who included amateur radio clubs, manufacturers, and professional societies, staged public demonstrations of wireless technology across the capital to showcase the liveness of broadcast sound. Um, many of these involved sort of technological tricks, um, picking up um, a live sound from one side of the city, broadcasting it to the other um, through loudspeakers. Um, and what these radio spectacles showed was the invisibility and immateriality of wireless signals. But they also tapped into a growing fascination with sound amplification, for it was the possibility of hearing loudspeakers very distinct and modern sound that proved so critical, critical to their entertainment factor. Loudspeakers engineered sound was louder than natural sound, but it was also direct, penetrating, and non-reverberating, producing a bigger sensory impact on listeners, a feature that was fetishized by radio enthusiasts in the press who often conflated that amplified sound with radio waves' defiance of distance. Visitors to the International Wireless Salon at the Parisian Amusement Park Magic City, the journalist René Brier reported in a radio magazine, were captivated by the powerful loudspeaker named the Voice of the Giant, whose deafening, tyrannical voice monopolized the attention of the crowd. This loudspeaker, heard by thousands of exhibition attendees, provided for him a sonic manifestation of how wireless dominates the world. As he said, while participating in collective life, radio alone can become an integral part of the private patrimony of every man, however distant he may be from his brothers. Urban radio demonstrations in which listeners participated as part of a socially heterogeneous crowd that might include adults and children, men and women, bankers and street vendors, <laughs> invited audiences to imagine how radio waves transcended the boundaries between street and home, the neighborhoods of the city, or even between Paris and the provinces to unite individuals across vast distances through a simultaneous and collective listening experience. And while radio manufacturers constructed public radio listening halls solely to advertise their loudspeakers and sound equipment, radio stations themselves soon began competing to design grandiose sound spectacles that showcased broadcasting's potential to become more than a technological curiosity, but a medium of national or even international significance. In the 1930s, for example, PTT engineers frequently put loudspeakers in public squares to allow Parisians to listen to state radio broadcasts of state funerals, Bastille Day celebrations, um, and other such events. Um, not to be outdone, in 1930, the commercial station Radio Paris arranged for a live broadcast of the arrivals of the aviators Coste et Balance in the United States after their transatlantic air crossing, a feat that was achieved only through a very complex series of radio relays. The crowd that flooded the Place de la Concorde, which you see here, um, to listen to their arrival through loudspeakers was so large that it shut down traffic on nearby boulevards. Radio demonstrations like these created an urban soundscape that many people experienced as louder and more filled with sound than ever before. But they also remind us, I think, that radio's identity as a media was somewhat in flux long after it first debuted because radio boosters did not necessarily imagine people consuming sound at home. Public listening halls where people paid a small fee to listen to a concert or dance to some music broadcast through loudspeakers continued to flourish into the 1930s. And while uh, experiments like the radio train and the radio taxi were somewhat short-lived, Parisians continued to take advantage of other free listening spaces in restaurants, hotel lobbies, department stores, and the corner cafe or bar. 
this sonorization, if you want to use this word, of public and semi-public spaces um, enabled people to, from, well, people from across the social spectrum to participate in a variety of temporary and overlapping radio publics. But I want to emphasize as well that the persistence of these public sites for listening had much to do with the fact that many early radio enthusiasts were known as sans filistes. They listened in at home on home-built receivers with headsets, which was an experience that stood in sharp contrast to the public listening taking place on city streets. Home-built receivers were cheaper than factory-made radios um, into the 1930s, but all of this changed dramatically with the advent of the cathedral-shaped midget receiver in 1930. In addition to its comparatively low price, midgets had electrodynamic loudspeakers in the case that eliminated the screeching of the earlier horn-shaped loudspeakers and transmitted a wider range of frequencies. And certainly customers appreciated midgets' musicality, but the quality they most prized in the receiver was its amplification of sound, and thus its ability to resonate through multiple rooms or to drown out the noises of the neighbors. Nor should we be surprised that the first organized attempts to control the Parisian soundscape emerged in the wake of the domestic radio's democratization. By the early 1930s, the growing number of Parisians listening to broadcast sound at home, in public squares and parks, or in semi-public spaces, posed unprecedented challenge for municipal authorities as city residents and public figures began to grumble about their cacophonous surroundings. Noise complaints reflected both qualitative and quantitative transformations to the soundscape, but they also betrayed numerous other anxieties about modernity. But it was broadcast sound far more than the automobile horn or the rumbling of the metro that captured Parisians' attention through its ubiquity. For not only did the airways separate sounds from their original source, carrying ostensibly public messages into the private space of the home, but the shrieking and crackling of loudspeakers, radios, and phonographs that resounded from shops, stadiums, bars, and music halls onto the streets turned neighborhoods into nightmarish fêtes foraines. In the 19th century, municipal authorities heard noise primarily as a manifestation of social disorder, an association reinforced by the capital's history as a stage for political protest. The very first interwar municipal noise ordinances thus prohibited the use of phonographs on the public thoroughfare on the grounds that they might disrupt public tranquility by clogging the sidewalks with listeners. A 1919 decree mandated that businesses obtain permits for loudspeaker use, a regulation intended to limit unauthorized political gatherings, and to prevent wine merchants from creating impromptu dance halls in their shops. But as the 1920s progressed, the Parisian police, preoccupied with crime and political surveillance, simply lacked the manpower and the resources to enforce, enforce noise ordinances in a city with thousands of offenders, particularly when businessmen and politicians flooded the desks of police chiefs with a request to employ loudspeakers in public venues. But radio challenged these methods of noise control because the ostensibly private sounds of personal radio receivers resonated through buildings into semi-public spaces, such as courtyards, gardens, and of course, sidewalks and streets. For decades, urban hygienists and social theorists had portrayed the home as a sanctuary to which the bourgeois family could retreat to protect themselves from the chaos of the streets and the lower orders, but now private homes and frequently their respectable residents became the source of sonic disorder. When people left their windows open during the summer, a displeasing mixture of political speeches, sports matches, and music flooded the surrounding areas. This amplified volume of Paris, the newspaper Le Matin confirmed in 1931, resulted as much from the internal noises of buildings and, its re and their residents as it did from industrial racket. Moreover, modern buildings constructed of iron and reinforced concrete were indiscreet structures, while minimalist Art Deco interiors eliminated noise-reducing materials like rugs, which were common to earlier Victorian and Art Nouveau interiors. Concierge prevailed on their radio owners with a taste for loud music, who one journalist christened haute Euler, <laughs> to close their windows when they were listening to the radio, but often to little effect. And it's clear that some people enjoyed simply annoying their neighbors. <laughs> While complaints about radio noise reflected city dwellers' practical concerns, such as the inability to sleep or work, they also proved to be highly subjective, at times revealing more about the social background and political sympathies of those lodging the protests than the sonic qualities of the noise itself. When discreet, wireless is a friend, the psychiatrist Henri Lemel wrote in the Mercure de France, but how can one accept the Yankee speech, Negro tangos, that French stations, reputable but complicit, furnish all the noisemakers of France? 
The right-leaning urban chronicler Paul Léon Fargue, for his part, worried that broadcasting had homogenized the Parisian soundscape by drying, drowning out the voices of street criers that had once defined neighborhoods, replacing them with generic broadcasts that could be heard across the city. For Georges Duhamel, however, France's growing noise problem had less to do with the jazz and popular music people consumed, although he despised both, um, than when and where people listened, and most importantly, the volume of their sound devices. This emerging politics of listening, in his view, exemplified the pressing political dilemmas of the day, such as the fate of the individual in a mass society. In his 1932 Querelle de Famille, he railed against what he called the communism of noise, which forced him to listen to sounds not of his choosing. Although French law still appeared to protect individual property against the most flagrant aggressions, he complained, in reality, people no longer had the right to quiet or privacy in their homes, for he who possesses a parcel of space does not possess the freedom to silence his space. And of course, he goes on to call, um, somewhat in jest, for a, a ministry of noise. <clears throat> Municipal authorities and the police came under renewed pressure to reign in the capital's soundscape in 1931 when the Touring Club de France launched a noise abatement campaign that drew on longstanding bourgeois traditions valorizing silence as evidence of respectability and self-control. Given the subjectivity of noise complaints, the Touring Club set out to provide objective proof of the harmful effects of noise on the human body and hired the director of the Laboratoire d'Essai at the Conservatoire National des Arts et Métiers to measure noise in several squares and traffic intersections around the city. But more importantly, the touring club garnered the support of sanitary reformers who began to treat noise, much like the insalubrious dwellings, dark alleys, and overflowing sewers of the pre-Hausman city, as detrimental to the physical health of individuals and the national population as a whole. Dr. René Martial, the municipal director of hygiene for Paris and one of many of the physicians to weigh in on the question, argued that traffic and industrial noise, when combined with the howling loudspeakers of radios and gramophones, inflicted a kind of urban shell shock on civilians. He called these people bruité, um, and he described them as suffering from sleep disorders, circulatory congestion, and auditory hallucinations, um, some of which required their incarceration. <clears throat> The Touring Club's noise reformers, however, found their most powerful advocate in the police prefect Jean Chiappe. An enthusiastic modernizer, Chiappe believed that eliminating noise would establish order and transform Paris into a modern city. And in 1931, he issued a sweeping noise ordinance that banned the use of automobile horns at night, restricted the hours of nightclubs, and targeted radios for the first time. Reiterating bans on unauthorized loudspeakers on the public thoroughfare, he added provisions to ban noises made inside properties and residences coming from phonographs, loudspeakers, and musical instruments. Radio clubs in Paris and the provinces immediately rose up against these new regulations, defending audiences' right to listen in any way they chose. The radio magazine L'Antenne, for example, insisted that authorities were confused about the nature of broadcast sound, for radio broadcasting could not be considered, they said, noise in the same category as the dings of a cash register or the honks of a horn. Others insisted that listening is an indisputable right that must be protected under conditions as liberal as music, theater, and public lectures. Defending his position before the Parisian Municipal Assembly in 1932, Chiap insisted that he was, quote, not making war against noises that are an expression of Parisian activity but that it was the policeman's duty to eliminate useless noises. But his successor, Roger Langeron, found it necessary to extend the battle against sound in 1935 by dispatching police cyclists to residences when someone complained about loudspeaker noise. But despite the threat of a crackdown, radio listeners ultimately had little to fear, for municipal legislation did not permit the police to prosecute offenders under criminal charges, but only impose fines. And we know that between 1935 and 1937, the police recorded some 15,000 noise violations, 4,000 of which involved phonographs and radios inside buildings. <laughs> they handed out a lot of tickets, too. <clears throat> By the mid-1930s, then, the everyday politics of listening, or questions about how, when, and where it was acceptable for people to listen to broadcast sound, would become increasingly tangled in the partisan politics of the Popular Front era and the growing divide between the far left and the far right in France as politicians from across the political spectrum sought to harness the airwaves to communicate with voters in their homes, as well as in public spaces. But tensions over who should control the soundscape, as we have seen, were much more 
revolved much more around radio's disruptive qualities as a modern sound media than they did around the content of the programs themselves or even the specific sounds that people listen to. When was broadcast sound public? When was it private? To what extent should the government protect audiences' right to listen or intervene to ensure quiet? And more particularly, what should be the state of the ear in France? These questions would continue to preoccupy and divide people throughout the interwar decades. Thank you, Rebecca. Our fourth and final paper comes from Aimé Boutin, is a professor of French and the French program coordinator at Florida State University. Her specialty is 19th century French studies with a focus on poetry, art history, women writers, and the city in literature. She explored the meaning of church bells in her 2002 article, Ring Out the Old, Ring in the New, the Symbolism of Bells in 19th Century French Poetry. And she worked with street criers in her book, City of Noise, Sound and 19th Century Paris, published in 2015 by the University of Illinois Press. She is the co-editor of the journal, 19th Century French Studies. Book, book reviews. I'm sorry. Book review co-editor with Elizabeth Emily. The book review co-editor. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Uh, her presentation today is entitled Sounding Out Urban Mobility in 19th Century Paris. Thank you very much. I also wanted to mention um, that uh, along with some colleagues at Florida State, we are um, holding this conference, which is on a theme um, that is uh, linked to ours, Le Bruit des Femmes. And so I'd be, uh, my talk today doesn't really deal with gender and neither have the others, but the conference will. And if there are any questions, um, it, this might be the panel to address those. All right. Since we often think of or conceptualize listening as a sedentary practice, as we listen to concert music, radio or lectures in place, I wanted to bring up the sense of sounds on the move. What is the relationship between sound, audition, and urban mobility? So today I'd like to share some reflections on what I called oral flannery, as a, uh, what I, yeah, in my book, um, as a trope for modern urban mobility understood in relation to sound and the senses. I first defined oral flannery in um, the journal article in 19, and I later adapted it in, in my 2015 book, City of Noise. So oral flannery shifts the attention away from a predominantly visual paradigm to an embodied paradigm. Specifically, it rethinks the visual bias in definitions of the flaneur as a detached and max a masculine type, which, culture, which, which cultural critics have inherited from Walter Benjamin, and it invites us to tune our ears to a more sensual resonance, to the more sensual resonances of walking. In the 19th century context, particularly in the writings of the amateur historian and flaneur Victor Fournel, the trope of oral flannery focuses our attention on the sensory and intersensorial acuity of the flaneur or the flaneurs. Um, through their ears, we hear raucous street musicians, especially organ grinders, performers in cafes, military parades, and the cries of street vendors. The flaneur or flaneurs listens perceptively to the confusion of fragmented sounds around him or her, deciphers them, and transforms them into a harmonious musical score. By structuring the street noise into musical sound, the flaneur or flaneurs reconceives the city as a concert with him or herself as the concert master. Indeed, the flaneur flaneurs orders his or her environment into a panorama of sound in such a way as to prop the oral on the visual paradigm corresponding to the sequential layout of the friezes of Cri de Paris. Um, so looking back at my argument here that I developed in the book, I still see how uh, I'm relying on the visual and sort of trying to reconceive the oral in terms of the visual paradigm. 
since the records we have of street choirs are art historical. And so we rely on images to understand sound, and there's nothing wrong with that, but it does tie you into a loop where you can never escape that inter intersensorial. So in order to actively resist the visual paradigm and make sense of the flaneur in all its sonorous dimensions, I found it helpful to redirect my approach to the term and think à rebours. So rather than start with the origins of the term in the 18th and 19th century and move forward through Baudelaire and Benjamin, the surrealists and the situationists, I'm going to draw from my experience in the present and feel my way back into an understanding of the sense of sound in relation to the social, political, and aesthetic potential of walking then and now. So other scholars um, engaged in the sensory turn in the humanities and social sciences are also trying to find ways to get in touch with the embodied experience of urban mobility. Human geographers in particular have focused attention to bringing in, uh, being in and moving through the city. And in doing so, they frequently point to the flaneur as the quintessential, quote, modern hero, able to travel, to arrive, to gaze, to move on, to be anonymous, to be in a liminal zone. In other words, to be out in public and moving about in the city's paved public spaces among strangers. And this is from John Urey. Um, as the editors of Mobile Met Methodologies state, quote, Baudelaire, Baudelaire's 19th century flaneur understood that it was not just to be in the city that brought one close to it, but it was the movement through it that allowed them to truly experience it. Baudelaire had indeed evoked the image of the kaleidoscope gifted with consciousness to figure the energy of the shifting eye of the, moving, of the flaneur moving through the city. And he's referring, of course, to a proto-cinematic device um, of the kaleidoscope, but let's remember that this is also a haptic device because it requires the hand to turn the kaleidoscope, so it's already an intersensorial device. And one could argue that Baudelaire's trope is trying to bring in different senses into his metaphor for the flaneur, so from the outset. Um, in a recent article on the flaneur in the journal Social Anthropology, Coates argues that going back to, Fla to Baudelaire's creative as opposed to Benjamin's alienated flaneur reconnects with, quote, the immersive and sensory sophistication of the flaneur. So for Coates, by precluding Benjamin's mythical, or we could say textual or literary type of the flaneur, Coates suggests that we move directly from Baudelaire to the pedestrian described by Michel de Certeau and Jean-Paul Thibault. And this would help us reconnect with the embodied experience of urban mobility. So it remains to add sound to the mix and to tune into the peripatetic oral experience. So I had the opportunity to explore the relationship between urban mobility and sound on the ground as it were when I led a summer course this, um, this past summer called Walking in London. So my interest in sound and walking was also piqued this past summer when I had the opportunity to participate in a workshop called Ways to Wander the Galleries at the Tate Modern in which we examined um, sound walking art, um, especially the sound installations, two sound installations, one by Janet Cardiff and one by Bruce Noman. Um, and these two sound artists combine walking and sound in their practice. Um, so a pioneer of this practice of sound walking is Hildegard Vestekamp. She defines sound walking as, quote, an excursion whose main purpose is listening to the environment. It is exposing our ears to every sound around us, no matter where we are. And as John Driver explains, sound walking is, quote, a persistent yet markedly peripheral, peripheral activity of experimental music and sound art that combines locomotion with a state of readiness for attentive, unprejudiced listening and that protracts beyond the walls of the consecrated sites of dedicated otic practices, that is the concert hall, church, or lecture theater. <clears throat> So sound walks as contemporary practices in acoustic ecology use field recordings and approach sound as sound. They recreate these sound, these field recordings in then a museum environment and invite you to listen actively 
um, by changing the context. So in contrast, the Flaneur tradition relies on texts and the sonic traces researchers identify therein. So I am suggesting that the literary tradition of Flannery can be too confining, but it's not because field recordings give us access to some inherent meaning of sound. So both recordings and textual traces alike rely on context, memory to generate meaning. But notwithstanding the anachronism, I think there's something to be gained by rethinking the 19th century flaneur as sound walking. So what does, it, what does fleshing out walking and sound entail? So in the following minutes remaining in my talk, I'd like to offer a few reflections on how to think about sound, space, and urban mobility. So my first remark would be to remind us that the ear is, already, is always open. Um, François Noodleman also mentioned this, and perhaps Sarah Kay as well, so we all know this. But unlike the eyelids, we cannot close the ears, which means that sounds penetrate into, the, into consciousness involuntarily to a greater extent than visual images. Sounds surround us. The memorable opening nine of Baudelaire's Une passante, la rue assourdissante autour de nous hurlait, vividly captures the surround sound effect overwhelming the poet. Frequently, the flaneur poet is jolted out of reverie by the ability of sound to penetrate consciousness. Um, we see this in Le Fou et les Nuages or in Le Mauvais Vitrier that I'll be discussing a little bit later. As sound theorist and cultural critic Stephen Connor explains in The Modern Auditory, sound defines, quote, a fluid, mobile, and voluminous conception of space. He continues, the most important distinguishing feature of auditory experience is its capacity to reconfigure space. He contrasts the rationalized Cartesian grid of the visualist imagination with acoustic space, adding that where auditory experience is dominant, we might say singular, perspectival gives way to plural, permeated space. The self-defined in terms of hearing rather than sight is a self-imagined not as a point but as a membrane, a channel through which vo voices, noises, and musics travel. So we already have a connection here between the background foreground um, point that was raised in the earlier session, and I'll come back to that. As a result, flaneurs cannot separate themselves from their social environment, and they must react to it. Wandering is truly about immersion as opposed to blasé disengagement. It's about diversion from the linear and visual model, as well as improvisation or repetition and variation in a musical sense or in an unscripted narrative. But is listening necessarily always passive? Is the ear primarily exposed to sounds that it must take in indiscriminately? Recall that one of the defining aspects of sound walking is that it invites active rather than passive listening. Active listening can involve becoming attuned to how everyday sounds and city rhythms change with the time of day, the season, the neighborhood, as well as how they syncopate with body rhythms, footsteps, memories, and past hearing experiences that linger in private as well as public spaces. Um, as an aside or a parenthesis, if I'm allowed, um, I just wanted to make a comment about how contemporary sound technologies have perhaps cha have changed this relationship to listening. The contemporary practice of wearing earbuds while walking in public spaces has dramatically changed the openness of the ear. During my course, um, while we were doing sound, practicing sound walkings, I had to um, instruct the students to actually remove those earbuds during class. It was um, like tearing a piece from them. It was very strange because I don't, I don't walk with earbuds. Um, I'm too old fashioned. Um, as Michael Bull has argued, headphones can distance people from their sonic environments, forestall immersion into the surroundings, and enable a cocoon effect that anesthetizes the listener. 
Others, most recently Alan Watson and Dominica Drakeford Allen in the International Journal of Urban and Regional Research, have suggested on the contrary that mobile music helps listeners to tune in rather than tune out the physicality of the city and can thus, can thus recalibrate the experience of urban speciality. So here we come bringing in the background or adding your own background to your walking experience. So what I'm saying about the modern era may no longer apply to our contemporary times, and this might be a point that we could discuss further in the discussion period. So thinking about sound in relation to walking foregrounds the spatial dimension of the sonic. This is my second point. The trope of the soundscape developed by Murray Schaefer and popularized in um, acoustic ecology, sound studies, musicology, as well as other fields, relies on a spatial metaphor to connote the immersive sonic landscape or paysage sonore, if we borrow Alain Corbin's term, that surrounds and envelops the listener. The speciality of sound has also been understood in terms of atmosphere or ambiance. Uh, though without qualification, these terms, like the term soundscape, don't in themselves elucidate the listener's role in perceiving and producing socio-spatial relationships. The term ambiance is used by the French architectural historian Olivier Ballet, who writes that, quote, l'ambiance um, comme objet d'étude mais donc en avant la recherche de la corrélation entre la réception par les sens de la société vivante avec l'architecture, la ville, l'aménagement intérieur d'une part, et d'autre part, la production sensible des actions humaines qui correspondent aux conditions et au confort de la vie cherchée dans cette, dans cette architecture et cette ville. So what I find compelling about Ballet's approach is the way he connects the material dispositions of architectural space and their experiential or sensorial effects. So in City of Noise, I drew extensively from Ballet's research on 19th century Lyon to examine how the material transformations of 19th century Paris resulting from urban renewal before and after Haussmann changed the perception of sound in the city and the emotions and memory, memories attached to that space. Haussmann, of course, destroyed the medieval core of the city to build wide boulevards, squares, parks, and vistas that give today's Paris its look and feel. Uh, when, when Haussmann widened the streets into boulevards and standardized Parisian architecture under the Second Empire, he also profoundly reshaped city dwellers' sensorium. Take the one example of gutting the medieval core of the city, um, so how the dimensions of the, the wide boulevards were opposed to the narrow streets with their architecture that wasn't, um, uh, Hausmann's buildings were plain, were straight, the surface was straight, and um, medieval buildings were multi-story dwellings of uneven height. And so this affected the alignment, the width, and the length of um, the streets and impacted how voices carried in the street. All right. Um, so that means that um, the boulevards wouldn't return echoes because they wouldn't be a resonant space as narrow medieval streets and thus people couldn't hear themselves and street cries sort of disappeared from those parts of the city relegated to other neighborhoods. They didn't entirely disappear but they were relegated to other neighborhoods and other techniques. Mm -hmm loudspeakers, for example, um, ice cream trucks. All right, so adding mobility to the spatial sonic paradigm is my third point. Moving through public space occasions social interactions in the form of sonic encounters, um, engagements, or confrontations with others. The sonic environment is therefore shaped by these social and bodily contingencies. Short of bumping into other people, encounters are often vocal, consisting of taunts, supplications, or catcalls. Our encounters aren't necessarily face-to-face, -face, as in the visual par paradigm. In fact, you can have an encounter with someone you cannot see but only hear, which, was, which would be an acousmatic encounter. In Baudelaire's prose poem, Le Mauvais Vitrier, he describes such an encounter because first he hears the vitrier um, through the thick atmosphere, and then this is cause for his 
demonic reaction um, when he drops a flower pot on the glazier's um, panes of glass. All right. Um, another example pertains to the changing perception of cries of female vendors as taunts or as male tradesmen giving, pr producing catcalls and the changing expectations of civility and personal safety that are involved. Okay, so as I worked, um, I'm almost finished here. So, As I worked in my book, I moved from understanding the Flaneur as a listener in terms of empiricism and introspection that maintains the individualist and detached paradigm to thinking of modern Flanerie in, a more, dy in more dynamic terms. Understood in terms of intersub intersubjectivity, the act of listening engages the subject and invites the participation of others in that very act of listening. Some sounds connect people to building community and fostering a sense of belonging, while others and antag antagonistic noises cause division and hostility. Sound creates a relational space, and sound space and social relations are intertwined. Thinking sound, space, and social encounters with urban mobility together focuses attention on the flows between and within communities of listeners and more broadly on the relationship between sound, civility, and public space. Flaneur listeners may become socially engaged by making sense of the crowd and engaging with human diversity. And this, um, thinking these terms in these, in these new ways, help us rethink how um, the feel of the city as you walk through it. Thank you. Thank you very much for these four um, insightful and rich papers. Um, at this point, I would like to open up the conversation um, between you four. If there's a question you would like to pose each other, or a, a common in intervention about um, each other's papers or approaches or work, I'd love to start with that before we open to the public. Can I, can I ask a question? It, it, it came up in the earlier session of which, unfortunately, I only heard part, but it's come up explicitly and implicitly. And it'd be kind of fun to think about, I mean, in the past, you might have to think century by century in the last 100 years or so, decade by decade, but thinking about the ways in which the changes in the ways in which, the changes of the sounds in the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was the introduction of the automobile and right. all the new sounds that that brought in. Or mm -hmm. I remember uh, the years of the boom box. Yes. which was omnipresent, it was, which was su su such an invasive sound. Mm -hmm. Now the good news is, both the good news and the bad news, that everybody has retreated into earbuds, and so when you're traveling on public transportation or even in the street, everybody's just completely tuned out to everybody else. But it'd be kind of fun to think about the ways in which new, the new sounds came in decade by decade and other sounds disappeared. Right. Uh, it might be a kind of interesting exercise we could all all participate in, but it seems to have made a great deal of difference in how people experienced um, life in the city. <clears throat> also related to the issue of, I was thinking, and this is my, my paper too, and I loved both your book and your article, which were extremely useful for me, but the issue of control, that is, what can you, what as you're walking around or living, what sounds can you control and what sounds are really beyond your control? And at what point do you perceive the sounds that you have to hear as din? I mean, this, and of course, this has to do with the flaneur as well. So right. these two topics strike me as things that might be kind of fun to think about. Well, in terms of control, of course, um, it, there's also the added um, many sounds that are present that you don't control, that you hear, don't actually bother you because you don't hear them anymore. Um, so the Good regular point. sound of traffic, <clears throat> not necessarily honking, but just the noise of the motor. We all hear that mm -hmm. all day long, but we probably don't. We Good tune point. it out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so one, one of the, when I picked street criers for the book, one of the things that I thought long and hard about was what made that sound distinctive. Why was I picking that sound? Why mm -hmm. wasn't I picking like horses, carriages? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that we have to think about the sounds that we can tune out that are mm -hmm. background noise and those that kind of rise above it and mm -hmm. what the qualities are of those sounds that, that rise mm -hmm. above. So in your paper, you, dis you, you chose those two sounds, bells and street cries, 
they rose above because they were louder, but they also connected to codes, as right. you pointed out. Mm -hmm. So people had to listen because they, there was information. And unpredictable, therein. unpredictability. Unpredictable, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Please, Anna Craig. Actually, one of the really interesting things about these uh, bells and street cries is the fact that you cannot tune them out. And um, there has been some recent work on bells um, and music. And the way in which, uh, in, for example, uh, 17th century Florence and other such places, the bells became so predominant because you'd get them for every mass, you get them for every hour, you get them for, for whatever is going on. The bells are around and you can't escape the bells. And so the question is, how can you create silence mm -hmm. in, in an environment that, where you have bells? And one of the interesting things that happened is that people were starting to think about music not as music for itself, but as something that allows you to escape the bells, the endless <laughs> sound of bells. So and, yeah. and that reminded me both of what you were talking about medieval Paris, but also what you were saying in terms of what is going on with, with the loudspeakers. Uh, you know, how do you create silence out of a different sonic um, mode? So how can you, for example, use your radio or especially the gramophone not so much the radio i think but the gramophone to create ordered sounds through music and this is getting me uh, back into my my beethoven example because beethoven then in this case but other western classical music becomes the bulwark uh, i hope that's how you pronounce it it's, it's <laughs> It's one of those words I know how to pronounce in German, but not in English. Uh, this is bul bulwark against, uh, against other noise, against something that, uh, and, and of course, these are not neutral concepts. Um, the moment you are sort of uh, privileging one form of sound against the other, you're, making, you're creating a very clear hierarchy, and they are political, they are cultural, and they're all kinds of things. Uh, so, so, in a sense, these are, for me, things that connect these, the, our four papers, is really the values and uh, the kind of validation that is given to different kinds of sounds, whether it is heavenly bells or um, a self-actualized form of listening that a high-class flaneur may be able to pull off and that someone else who just has to be on top of the bus and, and, and take the horses around, can't escape. Mm -hmm. So. Yes. We can get rid of that one. So it's just thinking about Beethoven and the piano in the home, because then there are complaints about the loudness of the piano, which then the radio replaces. But I was curious when the, the piano was dominant. Well, the piano is a real... If you ever have seen the, the film, uh, the piano is actually a wonderful thing about the piano is it changes. Uh, keyboard instruments around the home have been around the home for a very long time, and so have been lutes and other things. But the piano got shifted into a steel-framed instrument with longer strings. That became a lot more noisy, and that happens in the middle of the 19th century, and then you get piano productions that get industrialized, and at the beginning of the 19th century, you have a couple of hundred pianos, uh, or a couple of thousand actually, uh, produced per year, and sold by the end of the 19th century, uh, the production of pianos is in the high six figures per year. So you can kind of imagine the kind of bell curve mm -hmm. of piano sound. I had a question for the panel about um, how sound builds community. Mm -hmm. So and the examples with bells and builds community because it's it's a public sound that addresses the the community and when you respond to it you you join that community mm -hmm. the radio also creates communities and you discuss the complexities of public and private communities and um, um, silence even commemorating uh, acts of commemoration through the absence of sound create community where everybody is showing their respect for those values um, how does 
the sense of community change? Is it always the same throughout the ages? Does sound just create community, or is there a, a variation? Of course, one problem with the bells is that there are people who are irritated by the bells. Yes. You know, even in the Middle Ages. I mean, I, yeah. think, I mean, I think there were always people who, you know, didn't feel like doing the Angelus. You know, so <laughs> you know what I'm saying, or didn't feel like going to mass. I mean, uh -huh. I mean, it, it, it creates community among those who wish to be part of the community, but mm -hmm. also could. I mean, when when Villon speaks of various bells, he speaks generally quite ironically about them. Mm -hmm. there's an, I'm not at all confident that he's speaking positively. So, you know, the bells were a pre presence that could or could not, I mean, it, it drew in some people and may have repelled or, mm -hmm. or irritated others. And it, and it certainly does today, as it did in Florence. I mean, right. there are people who shut up, the, shut, up, shut up those bells. They're just too noisy, you know. Mm -hmm. they, they ring at hours that people want to be sleeping or doing something else, and yes. it can seem invasive. So, I mean, it presumably created a clearer community in the Middle Ages than it has since. Mm -hmm. But, you know, even, I think it's always been a, a, a somewhat, there's always been a, how should we say, a, a, a dissonant voice in that. Yeah. In that. Now, whether the, whether the interesting issue about street vendors, I mean, a community of people who need products, you know, but that's yes. not, is that, a, what kind of a community is that? We well, all the, need, we the, all need I mean, food, but the people buying the products mm -hmm. from street criers, street mm -hmm. vendors, are not the um, well-to-do. Mm -hmm. um, so mm -hmm. the well-to-do either have other people responding to the street criers, so they send their servants down into the street, or they can buy in bulk or in shops. Mm -hmm. um, street, vi street criers vont au détail, so. Um, yeah, of course, it's also worth mentioning, mm -hmm. I didn't, I mean, along this, and these things ended up on the, cutting room floor, as it were, but obviously there were quiet bells that were inside mm -hmm. churches, and there were also quiet merchants who yes. had quiet stalls. Yes. So, I mean, I've been talking about the, the, loud, right. the loud bells yeah. and the loud merchants. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there was, there was another way of handling these, mm -hmm. these noises that were for people who actually wanted to be there right. and, were, and were carried on in a more civilized, mm -hmm. you might say more civilized tone, and that, that those people were probably more clearly drawn into the community of, you know, people who, who had their special shops that they always went to for right. spices or, you know, meat or anything else rather than... Well, with street cries, people felt a sense of community even if they never bought. Mm -hmm. um, it was more a, a sense of belonging to the mm -hmm. environment mm -hmm. because the sounds were familiar even right. if you didn't actually purchase that, no, that's um, true. I'm sure that's true. from that's true. vendors yeah. yourself. Mm -hmm. But I think, too, I mean, one of the things I'm sort of interested in, or one of the questions I was really interested in in my own work was the, the kind of fantasy of creating a community with sound. And especially with a technology like radio, I think that that fantasy is always there. And the presumption that you can do that is, it, it's presumed to be much more easier to achieve than it actually is, put it that way. Um, and I think that, unfortunately, I think that assumption pervades a lot of work on radio, this, the, the sense that there are these national audiences and national communities that are all tuning in, and in reality, there's something very, very different happening on the ground. Sorry. And I think that's, so it, it comes back to mm -hmm. this issue of challenges, because I think, too, when you have a, 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 a sound technology, there are other ways in which people can manipulate that technology to choose to be both in a community or outside of it. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, in the 1920s and 30s, a lot of people were choosing to be outside of it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, and so to me, that's actually one of the more interesting things about about what that about what sound technology can do. Right? Well, it's also related, it seems to me, the whole notion of you know of virtual communities. That is what makes a I mean, what makes a community, excuse the word, real or you know, mm -hmm. you know, I'm, I don't know what that's not the right word, but 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 communities that theoretically exist and mm -hmm. may exist, but we're not quite sure. I mean, all, obviously, that we're surrounded by what we think are virtual communities, but what, you know, I mean, I haven't given a whole lot of thought to virtual communities, I'm sorry to say, but clearly this, this the, the radio thing brings up this, this issue of, of virtual communities and what, what we take that to mean, you know? I just, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I think for me, I, I think there's a lot of technological work involved in that, but I think it also, that a lot of, I think a lot of the work on sort of this notion of imagined communities or virtual mm -hmm. communities relies on a certain notion about the passivity of the listener um, as, a, as a sort of receptor of sound that doesn't really exist, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. even in the era of mass mm -hmm. communication. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, mm -hmm. 
Um, thank you for, for great papers. It's really fascinating, and, and, and I hope you'll get together and write a uh, history of the air plug, um, <laughs> which, which is kind of my question. Wait, what did you say? I, hit, I mean, the, 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 there's a long history of, of sort of putting wax in your, wax in your ears, right, to, 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 to keep sound out, but the, the sort of mass production of, of, of cheap air plugs, I think, is quite recent from the 1960s. Well, and it's playing so music, and it's playing music. Yeah, well, right. playing mu but that's, it is different, though, right? Yeah. Like playing yeah, oh, music sure. to block yeah, out yeah. as opposed yeah, yeah, to really yeah, wanting to. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if, if on the sort of, uh, in the footnotes and the sidelines of your projects, you came across any of this. And maybe, maybe Rebecca in particular, I don't know, but, um, yeah. I actually did um, in the process, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, I, I was really interested in, in sort of how physicians were responding to, to no the noise problem. Um, and in fact, one of the guys I mentioned in my paper, um, Henri Lemel, who was a psychiatrist, developed um, quiet cures in a little you know, maison in the countryside. And one of the things that he developed was this device that you could sort of wrap around your head and plug into your ears so that you would be completely isolated at night. And he patented this device um, in the 30s. It looked terribly uncomfortable and I cannot, it was, it was sort of a combination sleep mask earplug device. Um, but this was clearly enough of a concern that, that this was happening quite a bit in the 30s, so. Huh. This is just a comment, and, and it's, it's actually going back to what Timmy just said in this how to create community kind of thing, because I occasionally live in the United Arab Emirates and where there's a call to prayer, and there's a call to prayer that's orchestrated five times a day. And uh, since I have been there, in, there, there are mosques everywhere, and so the noise is coming from everywhere. But instead of having separate muezzin who each does the call, the call is now recorded from the central mosque. So it's the same call from every mosque. Mm -hmm. And oh. I think that's an interesting thing to think about. And it's very loud. I'm yeah, it's very it. loud. <laughs> but when there were individual callers, when there were individual singers, it was a different thing that now, so I think there's some accommodation, in other words, to people who are bothered by it, but at the same time, the whole community is, has its rhythm from this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Thank you. And May, you, you mentioned house monetization, and it occurs to me that that must have been unbelievably loud. Yes. <laughs> Tearing down buildings. 20% yes. of the workforce, the Parisian workforce, was involved in that. And you can imagine the cries of workers and the grunts and so on. It was mm -hmm. hard physical labor. I don't rem remember, I've read a fair amount about house monetization. I don't remember reading very much about the sound of it. And I'm wondering if that's because I just wasn't attentive to it. The only thing I can think of is Zola's narrator in La Samoir talks about the, trud the trudging footsteps of the workers who are commuting by foot from the outskirts mm -hmm. into the center of the city. But is there other stuff that, that, that talks about that? Uh, well, Baudelaire talks about it a lot. I mean, his poems um, represent the sounds of Paris um, a lot. Um, even in Le Signe, in the there's one stanza, stanza where there's some references to, to noise. Um, I kind of got this, when I was looking for evidence, one of the big question marks um, was why some people talk about sound and others don't. Um, it's not because the sounds aren't there, but people don't, some people are sensitive and will write about it and others don't. So when you're researching sound, that's kind of a, a drawback with your sources. Your sources. Um, I think so Zola is a writer who does talk about sound, but mm -hmm. at least the the scholarly tradition that produced me really didn't emphasize that. Um, so you have to sort of retrain yourself to pick up on those details. Um, it was all about spectacle, and um, so it's easy not even to pick up the the traces. Um, so I have a question about Beethoven, and it's entirely possible that I'm misremembering my undergraduate music history days, so please just tell me if I'm wrong. Um, but I was fascinated to hear that he was quickly received as a bulwark against noise, because of what I remember about the initial reception of Beethoven, that it was qu quite the contrary, that he was the vehicle of noise. I mean, the most obvious is the cuckoo in the Sixth Symphony, um, but I also remember vaguely an article about his imitation of trains, 
um, rhythmically and martial uh, noises in some of the symphonies. So can you comment on how, if that's correct, how Beethoven went from being thought of as this awful um, cacophony to very <laughs> shortly thereafter the sort of platonic ideal of music? Um, I think what we are having are two things. One is a uh, actually century long history. I mean, he was he died in ni in 1827. Uh, what I was talking about was a hundred years later. So a lot of things can happen. Uh, Berlioz and Wagner and others happened in between. So there is a kind of relative noisiness to Beethoven. <laughs> There's also, I mean, this, uh, there's also something else going on, and that is which Beethoven are we talking about? There's the Beethoven, the heroic Beethoven, who is never quiet. You know, the one who gets sung with thousands of people. So there are performances that are loud, and they're meant to be loud. Uh, the, the ninth at the Berlin Wall, when the Berlin Wall came down, um, was meant to be heard. Uh, but there is this other Beethoven, and that is a Beethoven mediated through the idea of suffering. And that is a Beethoven where you very often get the later music that sort of becomes complex, that needs contemplation to understand rather than just uh, the, the sense of hearing, which is also interesting if you're thinking about um, uh, your paper earlier about what goes into listening. Uh, are we supposed to listen with our minds? Are we uh, supposed to listen with our bodies, ears, and other things? So Beethoven reception could cross that thinking about uh, what goes into the trash, if you want, of um, not the, the, uh, the voice, but perhaps the music itself, is a very interesting thing uh, to, to sort of transfer, perhaps. Um, a lot also has to do, and this is where it's also getting very interesting, with recording technology. Because in 1927, you got uh, projects for the complete Beethoven rec recordings. And while, yes, I mean, you can play records relatively loudly, I think they're never quite as loud as a symphony orchestra uh, or even somebody just bashing the piano. So, so the listening to Beethoven changed as well. So I think there's, there's a lot that comes in and then there's just the cultural imaginary of the suffering and the silence that has very little to do with the actual decibel sound of Beethoven. But noisy Beethoven is part of the reception, very much so. Um, as I said, it got superseded by noisy Berlioz and noisy uh, Wagner. <laughs> this, this is kind of a question, because this is coming up from some of the stuff that I've been reading in order to be able to follow all of this and have something to say about theater. And it made me, and what you said, what you said, it made me think about this. Because, you know, theater, going to the theater up to the end of the 19th century was a noisy business. You were noisy inside the theater. There was no ri sort of ritual listening to the actors and adoring what they were doing and keeping your mouth shut. This happened in the 20th century. And I wonder if it didn't happen to a certain extent, because then the theater became a refuge from all that noise that was happening outside. So I was wondering about... Um, the institution of going to concerts and so on. I, I don't know anything about that. I mean, people go now uh, as though they were going to church, right? Uh, there, there is a certain <laughs> way in which uh, the art activity, going to hear arts, has replaced church. Hmm. Shall I answer that? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Uh, again, that's a 19th century development. I mean, listening to music was a very interesting thing in the, up to the 18th century. Some of it was con contemplative listening, some was making music together, some was simply, you know, background entertainment to, to whatever else was going on. There were competing noises and there were often attempts to actually get to listen what is going on. So the kind of listening that we associate with concerts, those does really start again with the Beethoven reception in the 19th century. And it's a mixture between two things. One is the spectacular display, if you want, of virtuosity and all kinds of things that you really want to listen to. But more has to do with a shift in aesthetics, that music moves into something that is to be contemplated, to be appreciated, to uh, learn it. Uh, that doesn't mean that learned aspect wasn't there earlier and you didn't have people listening very carefully to learned music, but as a kind of bourgeois imitation of aristocratic practices of the educated aristocracy, not the ones who sort of threw the chicken bones at the musicians. Um, that was something, again, that came with the 19th century. 
It wasn't happening all from one day to the other. You mentioned theatres. Operatic performances took a much longer time to be listened to than the concert hall. If you were going to the concert of the Société de uh, Concert du Conservatoire in the 1820s, oh boy, were you listening. There was no noise. You were really meant to listen. So, so it depended on the repertoire, and it began to shift, and, and you, then it moved. I mean, you can say much more about listening to the radio because you have the distracted listening to the radio, but you also would have concerts of gramophones where you would listen and sit quietly while you have communal listening to the gramophone and there would be a whole program and sometimes even with introductions. So again, there are these whole shifts of, of um, and that might actually talk to your question of community, mm -hmm. how even through technology you can create a live community through shared listening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if sound walking actually aims in part to create in both individual and communal experiences. If you go into a, an artwork with a group, then you listen together and you build on your personal experience as well as uh, communal or cultural references. So it's a very rich um, set of questions to transpose back on the flaneur, which tends to be studied in a kind of flat way or visual way. Thank, thanks. I, I, I wanted to actually thank you because I, I, I have a hard time understanding that fête de la musique. Okay, so. <laughs> but I think that these papers have actually done an incredibly good job of helping frame some of the issues of the community, the, the sound walking, the, all of the different bits and pieces. You go home and the music continues until 4 a.m. and it's noise and you try to shut it out and you turn on other music. Um, but as a kind of a throwback to all of these different forms of listening and it invites the participatory, I think, that MA was really getting at mm -hmm. in a way that you're not, you can't be passive. Mm -hmm. It's going back to these older models of, of participation. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I'm, now I have to go back to next year's Fetch and Amusy. I enjoyed listening to these a lot. I found, them, I found, I found it a, an illuminating panel. And, and my question is kind of a, a more of a theoretical one, I guess, about um, ab ab about what, what use can be made of the kinds of sources that are available mm -hmm. because the actual sound archives don't go back more than a hundred and so years, I don't believe. Um, and um, and I, wa I wonder how much pressure can be put on this notion of the intersensorial um, in such a way as to make uh, written or visual, particularly visual materials, a, a, a source of sound, a source for knowing more about sound. I, th I, I came to, into this area from working in animal studies, which is full of a kind of uh, methodological puritanism, where you're, <laughs> you're really not allowed to think about anything but the animal. If you think about anything else for a moment, you know, you've kind of corrupted the animal. And I, do, I wonder if there isn't something of the same puritanism around in sound studies. Oh, you looked at something, my God, you know, <laughs> stop. And, it, and I just wondered what, I mean, I, I, I'm asking, the question that I'm asking then is, um, aren't actually visual materials of various kinds extremely valid sources for the study of sound precisely because the, of the interactive nature of sound with other senses? Maya? Sure. Um, I think there are a whole host of uh, sources that can be made to work, thinking about the sonic. Uh, they can be anything from the literal remnants of buildings and other such things. And we have people who are actually measuring buildings and think about how sound reverberated and worked their way through that to texts descriptions that, and there is some recent work that is done around a group of, uh, of uh, people at Yale University who have tried to instrumentalize text to reconstruct both listening and sound production, which is not the same thing, which is one of the things I haven't done here, but it's something that one, I think one needs to be careful to tease out who listens, with which, in which way, and how can you listen? Do you listen actively and passively? But also, what instrumentarium do you have as a kind of referentiality to listening? Because sound is not quite sound. It's actually a whole complex thing. And then the visual, of course, gives you something. But there are other sources as well that I would like, as a musicologist, bring in, at least. Um, 
Uh, there are things like musical scores. There are things like um, descriptions of instruments, leftover instruments, all kinds of other sources that deal with, if you want, a structured sound, an organized sound, that sometimes allow us, through this, uh, through this organized sound, reach the unorganized sound. Uh, one of the best known examples is, of course, uh, Les Cris de Paris de Jeanne K. Uh, which is a, a, a chanson about the street cries of Paris, where he composes street cries of Paris, or La Bataille, which is another genre. So there are ways in which through these, you can maybe get to something. Yes, it's organized sound, and yes, it is something that is composed for upper class consumption. This is not for everyone. Uh, but it is also exoticizing, if you want that. Um, so, so there are sources, and I think you know we should just sort of um, work on creating this through encountering our historical subjects. Medievalists, in particular, in uh, musicology, have learned a lot from ethnomusicologists about how to think about all these kind of aspects. Can I just add one other thing? And that is, it seems to me that our our understanding, our definitions of literature, are often too narrow. Mm -hmm. I mean, I've gotten very interested in traditional songs, uh, of which there are a great many in French and in, you know, the, the child ballads and various, and, and many of these songs bring in, um, uh, I mean, issues of bells, uh, you know, cries in the street. I mean, they're, they're a very useful source of quite popular, in the, in the old sense of the word, popular material. Um, and so I think they're, they too are a very, and, and a lot of them, there are just a lot of them that still exist and a lot of, and a lot of them still have musical, and sometimes with multiple, multiple versions and variants, but a lot, you know, musical scores as well. So I think they're an also a useful, a useful quote unquote literary, but not so literary source. I have a quick question that might um, connect bourgeois expectations of the home, um, <laughs> sense of community, and acceptable levels of decibels, and that is family and communal singing. And I'm wondering how we're, um, both the change over time is connected with the development of technology that's going to be amplifying um, sounds. I know there's the radio program, I think it's Chanter dans mon quartier, that you go from community to community, from neighborhood to neighborhood, um, and broadcast, um, group singing, but led by professional singers. And so I'm curious as a source to chart some of these changes, both socially and culturally, have we come across either evidence or you know, a corpus of thought about it? Well, um, I didn't look at that question, but Joseph Mainzer, who mm. I discuss in my book, he led uh, group singing classes. Um, uh, so that could be a, a person to look at um, and we, we've, some of us have evoked noise as social disorder, so that activity was connected to social disorder, and he had to leave Paris to, first he was in Germany, then he came to Paris, then he went to London, because the activity of group singing was perceived as a threat, um, as threatening. Um, because the, the tradition of singing art songs in the yes. home is right. or in cafes, sort of old and distinguished, often, yeah. and then they're, the, you know, mm -hmm. sort of on all social levels. Right. Yeah. Uh, can, uh, oh. um, coming back to the question uh, of uh, Sarah about the source to know exactly what what kind of source we can get to know the sounds coming from this uh, ancient uh, or old times. Um, <clears throat> and once again, thank you for these uh, amazing papers and, and I want to read more about what you, you're working about. Uh, I was just wondering if, well, if it could be perhaps an illusion to, to know exactly what, what sounds uh, occur in these uh, societies. I mean, because there is a kind of well, an, an illusion perhaps of objectivity when you say that, well, you can calculate the, 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 rever the reverberation. Yes. Uh, and because, of course, as you said about uh, Beethoven, well, we, we, we don't listen to, 
to Beethoven the same way that then, right. uh, <laughs> of course, the, the listeners uh, uh, at the same time uh, could get access to this new music. You know? And also, that's funny, the way, you know, Beethoven, yes, <laughs> suddenly became a, well, a clear musician and uh, accepted by French uh, uh, in the interwar, uh, <laughs> in spite of nationalisms, a question of nationalisms, and, uh, but as you said, perhaps, Wagner became the, <laughs> the enemy. Uh, if we read uh, uh, Claudel or Gide, you know, that's, uh, that's Wagner, the, the, the new the, the enemy. But anyway, so, but it's the same, the same uh, is it the same problem for the, for example, for the Baroque music? Because I, don't re I remember 20 years ago, you know, there was such a fashion about, fashion about uh, the, the ancient uh, instruments. But, well, as if we could get access to the authentic uh, sound. But, well, there is no objectivity about the sound because we have not, we have not, not the, the, the same ears. The, so, and uh, we, we can't he hear mm -hmm. this instrument uh, the way a <laughs> listener uh, heard, the, heard them, you know? So, how do you deal with this question of uh, not only the source of sounds and the objectivity of sounds and the, the evolution of uh, listening the, uh, about what's about this well, it's, it's a problem of mythology perhaps um, I can take a shot at one aspect I think that both of those are very important questions to sort of try in at least um, as a researcher, it's helpful to try and reconstruct the environment that the sounds would have been heard of to get some kind of idea of what they might have sound like, even if it is just a hypothesis. So then you become aware that you are not simply transposing how you hear things today on how they were heard in the 19th century. And then you have to recognize that you can only go so far um, because they're in the era pre-recording, you have to imagine the sounds, which is where the visual documents come in. But I think that what the visual documents and some of these other types of documents that read the songs is memories. So all that, the social, the, the affect connected to the sounds is what you can reconstruct with the, docu with the visual documents or um, in the case of street criers, they also made little statuettes. So um, little sculptures, little figurines. Um, so there are many types of documents that can reconstruct um, or allow you to hypothesize what effective relationship um, people would have had to sounds, which were pleasant sounds, which were unpleasant sounds, um, the, you know, the quantity, the abundance, the, that kind of thing. Um, if I can just pick up on a couple of those things, uh, just to take it further. One is the reconstruction of sound. And the other is the question of listening. And I think uh, in terms of listening, uh, there's a whole host of research going on about historic listening and contemporary listening. Uh, in English, there's actually a scholar, a Shakespeare scholar, who has written a book about the period ear, how one might be able to reconstruct, at least theoretically, the idea what someone might have heard and how someone might have heard things. Um, I was quite struck by two things. Uh, one was that Sartre re recording and the other was Lacan uh, in Europe. Because in a sense, Sartre singing out of tune to us sounds absolutely absurd in one sense, and yet it was not. As a cultural practice, at the time, it would have not been completely out of, out of the realm. We are just used to listening to... Uh, to art music singers in perfect uh, autotune recordings. Mm -hmm. But the idea of the raw voice that is singing to the best of their ability, although I thought he was actually violating, he was recomposing for it, which is another thing and which I considered <laughs> something else. But at the same time, it also opens up a window, but our ears are not Sartre's ears or the ears of Sartre's time. Mm -hmm. so, so thinking about and having more recordings of that period may actually open our ears to not just the debris that you are identifying uh, in part of the voice, but also to what we might consider debris was actually not part of debris, but part of, the, of a just shared meaning that was given to song. 
Uh, the other was the Lacan with the silences and the rhetorical gesture, which again, I think we hear today uh, as people who over 70 years, no, it wasn't that much, 50 years later, are used to a whole different kind of uh, rhythm and gesture of speaking, whether it is French, English, or anything else, whether through television, politicians, or everything. But if I were thinking about Lacan and the way he was using silence and using emphasis and everything else, it echoes very much with recordings that we have from actors like Sarah Bernard and others. Mm -hmm. So he is actually drawing on a, on a sonic tradition. So in a sense, we can reconstruct listening, but it is a very careful thing by the time we have sound recordings. Uh, people who work on Shakespeare are looking for other documents. So thinking about listening, I think, is important. As for historically informed performance practice, that's another thing. Um, where musicians are thinking about how close can I come to the construction of the sound as it was produced at the time. No one is in that movement is that stupid to think that it is A, sounding as it did when Scarlatti played his uh, sonatas, and we would have this, the ears of the people in Naples in the early 18th century. I think that is a kind of caricature of early uh, the, the early music movement. It's more a sense of creating a non- 19th, early 20th century sound. Because what happened with the performance of Bach and everything else, it started sounding like Fauré or Beethoven and everything else because of the instruments and the gesture of performing. And so if you take that gesture of 19th, 20th century performance out and you try and recreate a gesture, a rhythm, development, breathing, uh, voice technique that is from a different period, you create a music that does not quite sound like Beethoven, performed by the Berlin Philharmonic, conducted by Herbert von Karajan. <laughs> and that was a political thing. I mean, we are talking in this round table about the politics of sound. It was a very strongly political thing that happened in the interwar years, trying to take the sound away from that music of the 19th century that is so much brought in with everything else that happened prior to the war that led to that war. Mm -hmm. And the radical modernity is not just Schoenberg, is not just Stravinsky, is not just Bauhaus, is not just that. It's also a recreating of something that is before that descent into romanticism. So the music has to sound different. It can't sound like Schumann. It really should not. Mm -hmm. And it's certainly not Wagner. So there is also a very, very political side to this movement. Sorry, this was a terribly long answer. But I just want to add one thing to you. And I think that when you're thinking about the history of listening, I think you actually have to think about the history of the ph physiology of listening. Because, I mean, I, I think in the 20s, right, this is a moment when what people understand hearing and listening to be itself is actually changing as a result of science. And so the idea of what it means to be deaf or to be hard of hearing is in, in and of itself shifting. Um, and I think that's important for how people understand the act, right, of, of listening to a radio or to anything else. But the, the other side of that too is that I think if you want to understand the value of sound or at a given moment, right, the perspective you can use to get to that, to in a sense, is by looking at the experience of, say, a deaf person, which is something that I'm also really interested in, right? W which is what happens when you do have, I mean, I write about this in some of my own work, what happens when you have this plethora of sound technologies that come around? What happens to the people who can't hear them? How do they understand their relationship to these acts? Suddenly, does listening become more important? Um, and, and can you look at the way societies are organized around listening? Um, I think that's another sort of window into it that a lot of people don't necessarily think about, but it's through that framework of alterity. I think we will stop because we still okay. need to get to the theater. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought since we started late, we'd go, but fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's 6.30, I think. Okay. I think we'll need to have a moment to okay. recover. <laughs>